Today I want to give my personal spin on the introduction to Ezekiel, what makes Ezekiel such an exciting book to me and such a relevant book. You'll read a lot of good stuff in, in Smith and uh, it's all important information, but this will just give a little bit of my heart for this great book, which is often overlooked. When I think of Ezekiel, I think of the word presence, the presence of God, the incredible impact that presence makes. So who was the prophet Ezekiel? The first thing that we recognize is that he's obviously a Jew. He was a Jew who was born and raised in Jerusalem. And then as a young adult, he's taken into captivity to Babylon in 593 BC. This captivity, this deportation of Ezekiel and probably his family and most of his friends brought on a fourfold crisis to Ezekiel and to the rest of the deportees. First of all, the deportation was a political crisis. This was the first clear evidence that Judah was about ready to lose its place among the people of nations, that it would soon go out of existence as a nation. That it hadn't happened yet, but it'll happen soon. Secondly, the deportation was an emotional crisis. T. Meyer, in the Dictionary of Old Testament Prophets, uh, points to several evidences of PTSD in Ezekiel's life. And whether you buy that particular diagnosis or not, certainly there's every reason to have PTSD. There is the violence of the attack on Jerusalem, which would have been brutal, which would have been complete, which would have totally disoriented the people of that proud city. And then there was a loss of all their material wealth. And finally, there was the humiliation of being dragged much like animals through city after city, through nation after nation, as the people who had been conquered. It was an emotional crisis. Third, the deportation was a spiritual crisis. And we see this in Ezekiel, and we see it to the people that he ministers to. They're asking profound, penetrating, worldview-shattering questions, such as, where was God? We trusted in God. We believed in God. We were the people of God. Was God not the all-powerful God that we had believed in? And by the way, there is a touch of irony here that is so much like us today. These are the people who had sinned. They would turned their back on God. They had violated God's principles. They had given themselves and worshipped to so many other gods. And yet, when they were punished for their sins, they began wondering about the nature of God. Finally, this was an economic crisis. In Babylon, Ezekiel was an out-of-work priest. He was raised to be a priest. He was raised to think that one day he'd take his place in the temple precincts, that there'd be ministry. It wouldn't always be the big glorious ministry, but there'd be something protective for him to do. And in doing the work of the priest, all of his physical and earthly needs would be taken care of. But in Babylon, there was no temple, and so there would be no work for him to do. This must have been a very discouraging, depressing thing for five years, building up into the 30th year. The 30th year, chapter 1 says, in my 30th year, this is important because it is the year he should have started his temple ministry. And so all of this crisis boils together in Ezekiel's life in that 30th year. And right at that part, part, when Ezekiel is grieving his station and the lack of any place in life, God appears. God appears at the point of his deepest need, at the point where he knew that God had given up, at the point where he didn't know how to move forward, God appeared. Once again, there's irony that in distant Babylon, Ezekiel saw what he might never have seen in Jerusalem's temple. He saw God. He saw the glory of God. He saw the presence of God. He saw the power of God. He saw God in a way which overwhelmed him and which made it almost impossible for him to express. It was a presence that was inexpressible. When Ezekiel was down in the very pit of his life, God revealed himself, and not just 
to Ezekiel, but to all people through the revelation of Ezekiel. Several things we can look at this first chapter and look to see about the presence of God. When God shows up, God is a mysterious presence. You look at all those weird wheels spinning every which direction. They seem to be spinning in every direction at once. And you say, what's going on here? What's going on with all these strange beasts? You know, and there's people who guess and there's people who paint pictures, which are all wonderful. But the fact is, it's a mysterious thing that you really can't get a clear definition on. And so God is hard to explain. Ezekiel throughout the book will frequently say, it looked to me somewhat like, you know, in other words, it was kind of, sort of, maybe a little bit like this, but not really, but kind of like that, but almost. God is hard to explain. And, and when you see God, you can't really boil him down into a few human words. And maybe the best of all, God is glorious. God is glorious. That the word kabod for the, for the glory of God comes over and over again in this book. And so it becomes one of the main themes. And if you have some extra time, you might want to do a, some research on the Hebrew word kabod, what it means, some of the origins, some of the colorings of the word itself, and then how it's used in the Old Testament. And so don't get too caught up with the details of all the strange things going on in chapter 1. The big picture is God appeared. And when God appears, everything changes. Everything that Ezekiel thought he'd given up, he receives in, in ways that he would have never imagined. Everything that he thought was down all of a sudden becomes an up. All of the lack of God's presence, of God's power, Suddenly, certain, suddenly becomes the fullness, the fullest expression yet of God's power in God's presence. When God appears, everything changes. So let's take just a minute to look at the broad outline of Ezekiel. Uh, T.M. Iyer does this for us. Uh, the, the first 24 chapters are, are warnings to Jerusalem. And you say, well, wait a minute. Ezekiel has been deported. Yes, Ezekiel was deported, but he was deported six or seven years before the, the last destruction of Judah. And so uh, he is there in Babylon, but he's writing back to the few people who still remain in Jerusalem. A glorious God deserves an obedient people. That's the, that's the theme of this warnings. That God is full of glory, that his people are not, and the God of glory deserves to have a people who are at least obedient. And then the second large section are the oracles, the things that Ezekiel sees that are the warnings to the four nations, chapters 25 to 32. This is very much like the section of Isaiah in chapters 13 to 30, or Jeremiah in chapters 46 to 51. All three of these big, quote unquote, major prophets have sections which, frankly, to us are boring and almost seem to be irrelevant until we capture the theme of what is it that, that God finds grievous in other nations. And once again, the big picture that God is powerful and that God will bring all of us to account Every nation will, will receive its just rewards for the way it has treated its citizens and the citizens of the world. And then finally, there are the promises of restoration, that the major theme of chapters 33 and 46 are the things that God is going to do as he shares his glory with his people. The major themes in Ezekiel run somewhat like this. There is the, the, the holiness of God, the kabod of God, the glory of God, the, the sense of when God's presence is somewhere, everything becomes changed. It becomes beautiful in a way that reflects his holiness. No other book of the Bible explores God's absolute awesomeness and otherness in such lavish language, T. Meyer says in page 220. No other book of the Bible 
explores God's awesome, absolute awesomeness and his otherness in such lavish language. And then there is the unworthiness of God's people, God's holiness, but the contrasted to the unworthiness of God's people. The people in the exile and the people still living back in Jerusalem and the leaders, all of them, whether they're in the exile, whether they're still in Jerusalem, whether they're followers or leaders, they're all singled out for their falling short of God's expectations. No one is left out. The unworthiness of God's people. And then finally, of course, uh, the, the great conclusion, God's gracious restoration of the unworthy people. God is holy. His people are unworthy. But God continues to restore them and to bring them to himself and to bring them back to the glory which was once theirs, which really, of course, is the glory of God. But the major theme, at least for me, of this book is the presence of God. God is everywhere. He's even in pagan nations. He's even in our times of deepest loss. God is presence, even present even when we want to forget him and we think that he has forgotten us. God is present. Now, God cannot be described or contained. He's, he's everywhere, but he's not manageable. You can't put your hands around him and contain him to, to that spot. But on the other hand, there's nowhere where your hands are that God is not also as well. As we look at this major theme, and you'll notice it as you go through the book, God is present in all sorts of unpredictable places, unpredictable way, but God is presence. And where his presence comes, it brings healings. Two of the, the striking pictures of the end of the book of chapter 37, the Valley of Bones, these dry bones, will these bones live? Asked Ezekiel, and God said, absolutely, because I am present. God brings life to the Valley of Bones. He brings them together. They had been disconnected and he connects them once again. And then he breathes in life. He gives purpose. He gives um, life to them. And then the last big picture, chapter 40, the river flowing from the temple, getting bigger and bigger, more powerful and more powerful. But as it flows from the temple, it brings healing to the nations. It brings life. Everything that's good and everything that's beautiful receives life from that river, which is a, a picture of the presence of God. But think about this just for a minute. The river carries God's presence out of the temple. What is it that does that? What carries God's presence out of the temple, out of the place of worship? That's us. That's us. When we gather for worship and then we leave, we are carrying God's presence with us. We gather for worship and we see the presence of God. And then when we leave to go out to our various avenues of life, we carry God's presence with us. And since we bear God's presence, we bring healing. That's the great promise of this book, I believe, is that the people who are unworthy, the people who are hurting, the people who are, feel like they've been exiled from all that's good and from all the past that was so wonderful, they enter into a renewed relationship with God that the river of life flows through them and brings healing to the people around them. I hope that you enjoy reading this book. I know it has a few spots that seem to be just a, a little bit tedious, but overall it is a great and exciting book that offers all sorts of possibilities for preaching, for teaching, and just for inspiration for the Christian today.